So tonight we're going to have a talk, and I think the full title is, is up there on the screen, uh, from Cancer Screening Services in rural Montana to the CDC's Ebola response in Guinea. Um, the, tonight's speaker uh, is Rose Till. Um, she works with the Montana screen, Cancer Screening Program and the Montana Tobacco Use Prevention Program at the Flathead City County Health Department in Kalispell. Her bachelor's degree is in French language and literature and global studies with a development and social justice emphasis from Pacific Lutheran University. And she has an MPA master public health degree uh, from the University of Montana here. She's traveled to over 30 countries, including 11 months teaching English in Chad. And uh, these experiences contributed to the unique insights on the role and importance of global public health and its players. Rose recently, and she's going to talk about this tonight, had the opportunity to join the CDC Ebola response in Guinea for six weeks, and she's here to reflect on that experience. And I would just like to add that it's not very often that I get to introduce a very recent graduate who was my student. Uh, Rose was my student only, I think, three years ago uh, in the Master of Public Health program. And today, uh, she's uh, been working with the CDC and she's doing all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, so for those of you who are students out there, um, she's a role model. Uh, I think you can be there too. It might take you a little longer than three years, but you'll be there too. Yeah. Rose. All right. Well, thanks, Dr. Kern. And I apologize in advance if I mess up these microphones. Um, not used to having microphones on me, so apologize in advance. Um, so as Dr. Kern said, my presentation is entitled From Cancer Screening Services in Rural Montana to the CDC's Ebola Response in Guinea, a reflection on the interdisciplinary, um, a reflection on interdisciplinary preparation, opportunities, and finding a niche in public health. So that's kind of a long title to have for a presentation. Um, but what I really wanted to get across, especially in this last piece here, um, is that it is a reflection. It is a journey. I'm not that much older than most of you. It wasn't that long ago that I was in school. Um, so I am very much reflecting here and still on this journey to finding what my career in public health, um, in global public health is. So if I can figure the remote out, actually just um, kind of to describe the picture before we move along, this photo was taken out the window of a six-story government building in downtown Conakry, Guinea, Guinea, a building that had a couple of fires in it while I was there and wasn't a very safe place to be. Um, but I think what this mural is portraying is many photographs of people who were in either involved in the Ebola response or were affected by um, Ebola in some manner. And so a couple, you can't really see the faces here on the computer, you can see them better. There's a couple of them that look familiar to me, um, but only one that I can really pinpoint that, you know, that's someone I know, that's someone I've worked with, and that is this guy right here. His name is Dr. Lamine, and he's one of the most influential imams, um, Muslim leaders in Guinea. And so he was an invaluable partner um, in our work there. So you can kind of see the government structure here, and then over on the right, you can see kind of your basic street, your basic taxis, um, what it looked like there. So. Um, as Dr. Kern talked about a little bit, I have kind of an interdisciplinary um, background. I 
grew up in Kalispell. I still live in Kalispell. Uh, went to college in um, Tacoma, Washington at Pacific Lutheran University. I started as an elementary education major, which lasted um, probably a semester. Um, I figured that's something that you can get a job with. Um, it's a useful degree. But I, you know, I really, that's not where my heart was. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, and I was taking some global studies classes. I loved global studies because why would you not love global studies? It's fascinating. Um, and, you know, the conversations you can have, the things you can learn in, within the umbrella of global studies is, is just great. I loved it. Um, so at PLU, you couldn't be a global studies major unless you had a primary major. Um, and I had taken four years of French in high school, not because I, you know, loved stripes and baguettes and berets and all the kind of French stereotypical things that you think about, um, but because I wanted a tool to go explore other things. Uh, and language, if you can speak another language, if you can access um, another way of communication, it really opens up a lot of doors to you. So that's why I studied French in high school. Um, at PLU, when I was really kind of wanting to switch out of being an elementary education major to global studies, and I needed this primary major, you know, I was already in 300 level French classes as a freshman. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I'll just major in French because that would be easy. I don't have that many more courses to take in French. Um, so I'll be a French major, but really I will be a global studies major. Um, and the way, the way it worked out, they really uh, benefited each other. Um, I spent a January term in Martinique, uh, a piece of France in the Caribbean. Um, I spent a semester in France, and those experiences both helped my French language skills, but also exposed me to um, a variety of cultural things, not just what you traditionally think of as French, but also um, you know, post-colonial issues in the Caribbean and Martinique. And uh, in France, I was studying with a variety of other international students, so that those blended very well. Um, then after college, I spent a year in Chad, which is a country in Central Africa that despite being three times the size of California, most people probably don't know it exists. Um, I have a map later, so if you don't know it ex where it is or that it exists, now you do, and I'll show you where it is. Um, so bef before I had graduated from college, I was interested in public health. Um, had actually applied to a Master's of Public Health program in Colorado. Got in, deferred it a year because I wanted to do something besides school. Um, you know, some adventure, some way to give back for a year. So I deferred it in order to go to Chad. Um, my um, emphasis in global studies uh, in college was uh, development and social justice. And, you know, what better way to implement that, to make that tangible, um, you know, what is development, what is social justice? Um, a way to do that is through public health. And so while I was in Chad, though I was there as an English teacher, not working in public health, um, I experienced a lot of things that just really did nothing but deepen my belief in, um, you know, health as a human right and as, you know, sustainable health development as a means to sustainable development in general. Um, so I did that, came back from Chad and forgot about the MPH program in Colorado and started my MPH here uh, at the University of Montana. Um, a lot of the coursework I did, I kind of tailored it to go global directions because that really um, has been one of my main interests in public health is, you know, how do you apply it in the, the developing world? Um, and I think that that has always interested me because it's so much more clear to see the impact of basic public health um, in the developing world than it is to see here because by and large in the United States, we have clean water. Um, by and large, we have 
enough doctors access to care. We do have issues with that, but not on the same scale as um, a lot of other places in the world. So I was interested in global health uh, because you can really see why public health matters and because I liked the adventures of learning about new people and places and things and going places. Um, so that's kind of a, a bigger um, explanation of my educational background. Um, you know, after, my, after I finished my MPH, despite the fact that it was, a lot of it was very global focused, I ended up getting a job in Kalispell, you know, back in my hometown. Um, so now I work at the Flathead City County Health Department, um, running the Montana Cancer Screening Program for that corner of the state. We serve uh, Flathead Lake, Lincoln, and Sanders County. So essentially, if you stand at Missoula, one arm north, one ar arm west, that whole corner of the state is our region. Um, we do free breast and cervical screenings for women who don't have insurance or have a high deductible and meet certain income guidelines. Um, and I also, one of the hats that I'm supposed to wear is uh, tobacco prevention, though. I end up doing a lot more cancer screening um, than that. So kind of a, you know, not what you would expect someone would do with a French degree is land back in Kalispell and, and talk about mammograms and pap smears all day. But that's what I do. Um, all of that to say, uh, what I want you to think about during my presentation is how all of the different interdisciplinary aspects of my education and of my experiences have kind of come together to create the opportunities that I've taken advantage of. And so while you're thinking about that, I also want you to think more deeply about how the different pieces of your educations, whether that's in school or outside of school, and how your experiences can come together to really create kind of unique opportunities um, for you. Kind of think about the, the unique ways that you can give back um, to global public health, to public health, how you uniquely fit into, um, into that work. So what can you bring to the table? To explain the picture a little bit, um, this is the uh, kind of the break room, the kitchen in our CDC office in Conakry, Guinea. Um, kind of a, a makeshift professional office. It used to be an apartment, so there'd be people, you know, working wherever they can find space. You can see some laptops back here. You know, once lunch was served, you kind of had to put your work aside for a bit. Um, and this particular day, this woman right here, uh, who is from uh, Ivory Coast, or Cote d'Ivoire, um, brought in a specialty from her country. Uh, the white rice-like substance here is called a cheque, and it's served with um, grilled fish here, which you can't really see in detail. But the point is that I'm asking you, you know, what, what can you bring to the table? Um, and Though all of the women here bring different things to the table. So um, starting over here, this woman right here is a former Peace Corps volunteer. She's also a nurse practitioner. She's worked in um, family planning clinics in Alaska and now works at the New York City uh, Public Health Department. Um, this lady here is originally Senegalese, moved to the States when she was probably in her early teens, speaks beautiful French and English. Um, she's an epidemiologist. Um, this lady right here is Ghanaian. She's a doctor, um, working on her English and uh, not doing too bad. And then this lady here, as I said, is from Cote d'Ivoire, and she's an anthropologist. She also has training in public health. So they're all bringing something to this response, something unique, um, which I think is pretty cool. So to talk a little bit about the Ebola outbreak, which you probably have heard at least something about on the news or did hear something about in 2014, 
um, when it was still on the news. So this uh, outbreak of Ebola started in 2000, I think March 2014 um, in Guinea, which is right here. Um, if you're looking over at the wider Africa map, here's Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia here. Chad is right there. So now you know that Chad exists and where it is. Um, so the Ebola outbreak started in March in Guinea, spread um, in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and didn't really hit the news in the U.S. until the fall of 2014 when we um, had a case I believe uh, a man coming, I believe it was from Liberia, came to Texas, uh, presented at a hospital. They sent him home. He came back. He died of um, Ebola. And so then it, it really exploded in the news in the U.S. because we were afraid that Ebola would ravage the United States. Um, it didn't. So the three main countries affected by this latest outbreak of Ebola, which is by far the largest Ebola outbreak in all known human history um, by a factor of, of at least 10, I think. Um, this outbreak was primarily in these three countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And I have um, kind of a chart here of how many cases were reported um, in each of those countries and how many deaths. And so the cases here, the exact terminology on that, and these, uh, these um, case numbers are as of the 13th of April of this year, so pretty up to date. Um, the most up to date that the CDC has posted at this point. The qualifier in cases here is all cases suspected, probable, and confirmed. Um, in countries like Guinea, lab access is not always easy. Um, maintaining a cold chain so that a sample can be adequately tested is not always easy. So the terminology suspected, probable, and confirmed is the best way to, to give you probably the, the closest academic guesstimate to the actual number of cases without um, labor laboratory confirmation of every single one of those. Um, what do you notice about these numbers? Do you notice anything? High mortality in Guinea. High mortality in Guinea. Exactly. So Guinea had the smallest number of cases, um, but by far the highest mortality rate. So about 67 percent of the people diagnosed with Ebola in Guinea died of it, um, which in a lot of ways is actually more consistent with um, historical Ebola outbreaks. Um, but the, if you look at the entire outbreak, um, only about 40 percent of people with Ebola died, which is very, very low. Like that's, that's never been seen before. Um, in previous Ebola outbreaks, um, just about everyone who's diagnosed dies there is not a cure um, for Ebola, per se. Um, so in addition to the cases listed here, there were 36 other cases, um, some of which were in kind of surrounding countries here, a couple in Europe, um, and one in the United States, or several in the United States. So there are other cases in Nigeria, Senegal, Spain, United States, Mali, the United Kingdom, and Italy. Of those 36 cases, um, 15 died. So the, the big thing to kind of notice here is that the far more fatalities in Guinea than, than the other countries. But that um, might have been because the number of cases were not accurately reported in Guinea compared to the other places. Yeah, that, that, that could be true. That, Cases in Guinea were not as accurately reported as in the other two um, countries. And I, I don't have uh, numbers and, and graphics on this, but by and large, the, the epidemic spread in Guinea a lot more slowly and consistently than it did um, in the other two countries. In the other two countries, it was much more 
like explosions, um, whereas in Guinea it kind of simmered and stayed um, throughout, which um, is one of the, the explanations for the lower number of cases um, in Guinea. So it's kind of an overview of the outbreak. Um, when I first heard about CDC being involved um, in Guinea, I was kind of surprised because you think of global health and you don't, you know, you don't think about the CDC, which is the United States government agency for public health, the, you know, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, usually you think about the World Health Organization or, or some kind of um, multilateral organization. You don't, I think of the CDC and I think of the, the organization that grants us money to run our program here. I think of um, the organization that, um, you know, reacts to or responds to um, disease outbreaks in the United States. I, I bef had not before thought about the CDC being involved in other countries, so it, it surprised me. Um, but to kind of explain that, CDC, uh, whoops, um, CDC deploys teams of technical advisors. CDC is not the implementing partner in any of these um, responses. So the, the implementing partner or set of partners um, is generally the national government. So in Guinea, we worked very closely with um, the Ghanaian government and the health officials that Guinea had set aside for the Ebola response. We worked very closely with them, very closely with the World Health Organization, um, and also with UNICEF. Um, so you can kind of see that here. This is at UNICEF headquarters in Guinea. Um, you can kind of see our CDC logo that's taken from um, riding in one of our land cruisers, which I did quite a lot of. Um, this is the sign on our office um, door. I'd often get questions like, well, what is CDC like? You know, because people, people generally know like what the World Health Organization is. They've seen the UNICEF logo. Um, they've, they've seen a lot of these um, big kind of partners that do a lot of development work, do a lot of response in developing countries. Um, but people didn't always know what CDC was. Um, so I, I think it's important here to say, to mention or to, to emphasize that CDC is technical, does technical assistance, um, most of which is epidemiological um, because that's kind of the CDC's forte. Um, but CDC is not in charge. Um, which, you know, sometimes while I was there I felt that I wished that we could just be in charge because it would be so much easier that way. We just said, you know, this is what we're going to do. Um, but it, it's a good thing, I believe, that CDC is not in charge, that CDC is one of many partners um, there to assist the local government um, in responding to a disease that's affecting their country, but that is also of international um, concern. So CDC, during the Ebola epidemic, um, had teams in uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and uh, Liberia. I think they also had a couple of people in Senegal just to kind of um, secure that border there. Uh, CDC still has teams in the, in the three primary countries, though they've gotten a lot smaller. Um, because the epidemic is winding down, um, also because a lot of funding has gone to Zika. So you've probably heard about um, Zika virus in a lot of Latin America and the Caribbean. So a lot of funding has gone that direction um, instead of Ebola, which Zika is arguably the, the larger danger right now if you had to compare them. Not that they're really comparable, but if you have to put out a lot of fires, sometimes you have to decide which one needs the most emphasis. So right now, that's Zika. Um, so you're probably wondering how I ended up in Guinea, because I 
don't work for CDC. I live in Montana. Um, so when Ebola hit the news in the U.S., or when I first heard about it, which was a little bit before it, you know, it exploded here, before we had a case in the U.S., I had just uh, you know, accepted my job. This is my first like professional job, um, which I was pretty excited about. But I was also kind of bummed because I felt that, you know, if I didn't have a job, I would absolutely want to go help out with the Ebola response because it's an excellent opportunity to put to use French language skills, which I have, um, experience in Francophone Africa. I, had been there several times. I'd lived there for almost a year. Um, you know, put to use my brand new public health degree. Like, what could be better than than going and, and working on Ebola? But I had just gotten this job, and I just I didn't feel like it was very respectable to quit your first professional job after three months. So I didn't. Um, however, last September. I found myself in Atlanta for a tobacco point of sale training and I happened to get together with a friend from college who um, I didn't know super well but I'd taken several global studies classes with her and I knew that she went on to study public health. She got her MPH from Emory University which is a very good school of public health right next to the CDC in Atlanta. and I somehow knew, I don't know if it was Instagram or Facebook or what, but I knew that she still lived in Atlanta. And with public health, I figured that she probably worked at the CDC. Um, just, I didn't know what she was doing there. Um, so we got together, got to talking. Turns out that she is doing a fellowship there at the CDC, and she is the Atlanta-based Sierra Leone country representative or a country officer for the uh, CDC's Emergency Operations Center for Ebola. So <coughs> that, that was a good connection there. Um, so she said that and I was floored and wanted to talk about Ebola and global health and everything. Um, and just kind of made a comment that, you know, if I didn't have a job, like that's exactly where I would want to be right now using my French degree because what can you do with a French degree? Uh, using my global studies degree, using public health, having an adventure. Um, and she told me about a program um, whereby the CDC, through the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, reimburses state and local health departments to send their employees to go work on um, the CDC's Ebola response teams. So I thought, well, I work for a, health, a local health department. That's the perfect opportunity for me. Um, luckily, my supervisor was okay with it. It took several months um, before the, the timing was right, staffing-wise, at our health department for me to be gone. Um, but finally, in January of this year, I went to Guinea um, and was there for six weeks. Um, so it's I'm really glad that, you know, I kept my professional job, got that on my resume, um, but also got this opportunity um, to go to Guinea. And hopefully it's, um, you know, something that has opened doors to future opportunities and, and future adventures there. So if you're wondering how on earth I got to Guinea, that's exactly how. Um, my past experiences in education and then um, people I knew within the public health field and the willingness to say like I really want to go is there any way that I can go um, and with that the French was uh, especially important um, they're desperate for public health professionals who can speak French um, and so while I was still um, in Atlanta in September I actually, the next day I visited my friend um, in the EOC at CDC, I caught a glimpse of Dr. Tom Frieden, the director of the CDC, which was very exciting. He's a celebrity um, in the public health world. Um, you know, I, I went and visited her and my friend, and she introduced me to the country officer for Guinea, who told me basically, 
send me your CV and when can you go? Um, so that, that kind of tells you how desperate they are for people who have, you know, public health knowledge and experience, but who can also communicate. Um, so that really helped me. I have several colleagues within public health who would love to go do something like that who don't have the French skills um, and they don't need them. Uh, both Sierra Leone and Liberia are English-speaking countries, so there hasn't been a lot of difficulty finding people to staff those teams. Um, but Guinea, the CDC, has had trouble um, from the very beginning. So it was perfect for me, perfect for them, and I went to Guinea in January and was there for six weeks. So when I arrived in Guinea in January, um, the outbreak had been declared over. The, the World Health Organization declared it over on the 29th of December 2015. Um, after 20, two 21 day periods um, had passed since the last active Ebola case in Guinea. And so after that, they moved into this period of 90 days of enhanced surveillance, um, which the entire time that I was in Guinea was during this uh, 90 days of enhanced surveillance period. Pictures here, this is um, a water tank on the building next door to our office. This is the view from our office window. Um, you have fishing boats here. Um, I should have pointed out exactly where Conakry is in Guinea um, when I was on the map. It's on the coast. It's the capital. It's on the coast on this little peninsula. Um, and so a lot of fishing, a lot of trade. It's a big port. Um, I actually heard that it's a major point, port for smuggling drugs between Europe and um, South America because it's kind of out on the promontory of Africa. So I don't have any details there, but I kind of an interesting tidbit. Um, and then the, for better or for worse, obligatory picture of cute children who wanted their picture taken. So I did let them see it, so I don't feel that bad about taking the picture. Um, so all right. So I originally, when I was signed up to go to Guinea, I was supposed to go as a field epidemiologist. Uh, when I got there, I was switched to the health communications team, which um, is probably a better fit for me. I, I can do epidemiology, but communications is much more closely related to what I do on a daily basis. Just, you know, different issue, different country, different language, but we can figure that out. So most of what I did um, was developing messages to be approved by the national communications cell, which was essentially the organization of all of the different um, NGOs, different governmental partners there to work on Ebola. Um, so we would come up with these messages that we wanted them to approve because, you know, we're, we're technical advisors, we're not the implementing partner. So once approved by them, they could be sent out to the media. Um, so a lot of what I did was, you know, writing question and answers, um, which in a way, I, I mean, I don't, I don't write question and answer things very often in my job here, but it is kind of a similar, similarity to my job here because I do a lot of um, interpreting from technical language into language that um, lay people can understand. So um, a lot of taking what, you know, the, the scientists and what the doctors and what the researchers were we're saying here that the people needed to do and writing it in a way that could be understand, understood by people and you know understood by the media who could then disseminate it to the population that um, is mostly illiterate. Um, so a lot of some of the things we did, um, this you can't really tell from the picture but it's a flip book. Um, all of the logos of the different partners down here and this Flipbook, I don't know if you guys know what flipbooks are. They're essentially a large book. Um, on one side you have a picture, and then on the other side um, kind of has a script for whoever is presenting the flipbook to read to explain the picture to the audience. 
then you flip the page over, there's another picture, kind of the, the next point they're going to make, um, same thing. So this is a, a flip book with lots of pictures kind of explaining, you know, what the people in strange suits were doing when they took away, your, you know, your family member's body after they had died, after they were really sick. Um, so that's something that we worked on. And so working with the CDC, I could take kind of the CDC's epidemiological um, expertise. I could take what our epidemiologists were saying need the, that the population needed to understand and then put that into a format that, um, you know, would make sense to someone who's not an epidemiologist, um, would make, hopefully make sense to someone who doesn't necessarily understand um, kind of the biomedical model. So that's an example of messages. You can kind of see another message here. This one's actually in French and English. Um, this is at the entrance to the airport. They're telling you to wash your hands. Um, whenever you entered any kind of official building, um, even some less official buildings if they wanted to, there would always be hand sanitizer. So you'd hand sanitize your hands. Um, our hotel, you always had to hand sanitize before you could come in. I'm not sure that the hand sanitizer was actually always hand sanitizer. Um, probably instances where it was really, really watered down or maybe just, you know, was water in a formerly hand sanitizer bottle. Um, but still, some messaging there. Um, this is actually inside of the airport. Um, I didn't do a very good job of taking pictures while I was there and then rushed to take a lot of them, um, you know, the last three days or so that I was there. So these are both from the airport. Um, another piece of communications work that I did was looking at this um, crisis emergency risk communication book from the CDC for, you know, a, a risk communication um, audience within the U.S., looking at this book and making kind of a, a one-page pointers for risk communication uh, sheet to hand to, you know, the, the national um, people working on communi Ebola communications because as technical advisors, one of our roles is uh, capacity building. So how can I take this, uh, cut it down by quite a bit. That was a very thick book, but so cut it down by quite a bit, um, translate it into French, and you know help the my national partners perhaps have some more skills to to communicate in um, crisis situations. So that's one of the projects that I worked on. Um, before I explain this picture, um, I. I will say that I, I left Guinea on, I think it, it was the 3rd or 4th of March. Um, we hadn't had any cases. We were looking towards getting to, toward, to the end of March, which would have been the end of our 90 days. Um, and then we were free and clear of Ebola. However, on March, I think it was the 16th, um, a new case of Ebola was identified in Guinea. And so that's that's the date when it was identified and, and noticed by the medical establishment. Doesn't necessarily mean that there weren't earlier cases that we just never knew about. Um, so um, as of now, um, the last Ebola patients from this smaller outbreak um, in Guinea um, have either died or been sent home. Um, and their, the 21-day monitoring of their contacts is complete. Um, and so the, the end of 42 days since the last um, Ebola case in Guinea will be on March 31st, at which point they'll start an entirely new 90-day period of enhanced surveillance. So when I heard that a new case of Ebola had been found in Guinea, it felt like, at first it felt like a defeat, but like two minutes later, it felt like a success because the fact that we identified a case of Ebola in Guinea is a success of the, um, of the disease surveillance system in Guinea. Um, finding 
or not finding a case doesn't mean that there weren't cases. It means that we didn't find them. So finding this case was a huge success. Um, I believe that it was actually reported by uh, villagers. Huge success because there had been a lot of reticence um, and not reporting of cases. So massive success of the local system that another case was found. Means that we recycle through all of these enhanced surveillance periods, um, but it's a good thing. So one of the reasons why with this Ebola outbreak um, there is a big epidemic and then you know the epidemic's declared over and then new cases have been found, which is not similar to any of the other outbreaks in history. One of the reasons for that is because this outbreak, unlike most others, has a lot of survivors. So some of the messaging that we did was around survivors. So you can see here, I um, only got a piece of this, but it's essentially, you know, what precautions can you take to avoid getting Ebola from a survivor? Um, so survivors can retain uh, Ebola virus in ocular fluid, in semen, and possibly in breast milk for an unknown amount of time. Um, because this hasn't really happened in past Ebola outbreaks, we don't really know how long it lasts. Um, so there's a lot of research on that. Um, but with that, there's also a lot of stigma surrounding people who have survived Ebola because, you know, we're in the same room. Am I going to get Ebola from you? Um, which, no. Um, I wouldn't get Ebola from you, but you know, there's a lot of fear surrounding that. Um, a lot of trauma during the epidemic, um, with you know a lot of family members dying, a lot of people dying, um, and so a lot of fear that it could come back, um, and so a lot of um, stigmatization of survivors. So that was some of our messaging work was to to explain what a survivor, what it meant to be a survivor you know, what could give you Ebola, what can't give you Ebola, and how to, um, you know, if you are a survivor, how to protect your family from that. If you're the family of a survivor, how to support your family member who survived Ebola, um, and also maintain your own health. So we did that. So some lessons that I learned. Um, I kind of broke this down into three main things. Um, the first thing is to be patient, which is a lesson that I seem to have to learn over and over and over again, and you probably will too, um, and already are learning that over and over again. Um, the national communications group wouldn't always meet. Um, we were supposed to meet every Wednesday. Sometimes that would get canceled. Sometimes I'd show up thinking that we had a meeting and would find out that it was canceled. Um, you know, we produced this set of flip books and sent it to the printer to be printed. And they kept saying, oh, it'll be done next week. It'll be done by Thursday, we promise. Um, they weren't finished by the time I left. Um, so that was frustrating, but... Um, the, the lesson there is to be patient um, and is to, to not be angry and wish that, well, I wish we were in control of this, I wish we were in charge, um, but to really, um, you know, be all about business, but be all about creating the relationships that are sustainable and building capacity. Um, and then with that also, patience with myself in times when I would get frustrated or would feel like, you know, I've studied French for 10 years, but I have absolutely no idea what's going on right now. Um, patience, it's a very good lesson for whatever you do. Um, and then while I was there, I also thought a lot about um, comfort and the meaning of the work that I was doing there, which I won't get into it too much depth. I could talk about that for hours, um, but since we're running up on time, I won't get into that. Um, this is the view from my hotel room that I lived in for six weeks. Four-star hotel. That's the Atlantic Ocean right there. That is a swimming pool. Um, hotel, kind of tiki bar. Really nice place. Um, when I was in Chad, I lived with a host family. We were a middle-class family. 
Um, we didn't have electricity most of the year. So I had a lot of kind of complicated feelings about being paid to live here, um, paid my regular salary, paid per diem, all kind of expenses covered. And was I really doing that much good? So like I said, complicated. I could talk about that for a long time. But it's something to think about in global public health. There's certainly a lot of glamour to going off and having these adventures, going places like Guinea, working for the CDC. Um, but I think we also need to not forget um, some of the implications of, of living somewhere like this. Um, so I hope that's something that wherever you go in your careers that you don't forget to think about. Um, it's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, but it's, it's there and it's important to think about. Um, and then, this is kind of cheesy, but my feet, my journey that I'm walking along, um, getting the opportunity to work with the a CDC Ebola response team um, as one of the youngest person, one of the youngest people on the team, one of the least educated, the least experienced, um, was a huge opportunity. I worked, um, you know, with people from all over the world um, who had years of experience. I worked with doctors, I worked with PhDs. Um, one of my friends is um, an infectious disease doctor. She'd worked with Doctors Without Borders in South Sudan, done all of these things. I worked with the um, medical director of um, chronic disease at the North Carolina State Health Department. So here I am, this new career person, um, getting this massive opportunity. So I felt very humbled um, to be able to do that. I felt that I learned way more than I actually gave back. Um, but it was also an opportunity to kind of see some of the career paths that I've thought about um, for the future, because I'm not, I'm not done with my education yet. I'm not planning to stay in my current position for forever and ever and ever. Um, I got a chance to see some of these different options played out, which was a really cool um, opportunity. So I think I'll just end there. Um, that was that, that was the highlight for the trip for me, definitely to to have the adventure of it, um, to have the learning experience and to have the you know here is this vast array of of career directions that I could go um, in some you know pretty pretty cool ways that I can can tie together my previous previous experiences to go some some interesting and important places so that, do you have any questions? Okay, let's uh, thank Rose for her talk. And then we'll... <laughs> well, I had several. I um, just was waiting for you guys to go first, but uh, <laughs> I can break the ice. Um, tell us some more about the effect of stigma. One of the students in my class is writing a paper, which I, haven't had, I received today, but I haven't had a chance to, to, to read yet, about how to um, how to help with stigma. You know, this was, it was a big problem, and how is that playing out right now, and what what's being effective in uh, uh, in changing people's attitudes, or is it still people still even a year later? Uh, have these kinds of uh, negative feelings about people who are survivors? Sure. Well, to, to answer the last part of that question first, people definitely still have negative feelings about survivors. Um, there are instances of violence towards people who have survived. Um, there are instances where, you know, a, a community doesn't want survivors to come back for fear that, you know, they'll reinfect the community. Um, most of the work that's going on is within Guinea, and I believe within Sierra Leone and Liberia as well, there are national kind of coalitions of survivors or, you know, networks of survivor groups that um, are really in the beginning, beginning stages of organizing themselves. Um, I 
think that their work, uh, what they see as their work is kind of organizing to support survivors, whatever survivors kind of decide that means. Um, one of the more tangible routes that um, CDC is supporting and that uh, some of the other partners are working on is actually semen testing. Um, since the Ebola virus can live on for over a year, um, between three months and a year, we don't really know yet. Um, part of that is research, you know, how long does it persist? Um, part of it is a service um, so that a male Ebola survivor can go get tested and you know, keep getting tested every so often, and then once he um, tests multiple times free of Ebola, he gets a certificate. So that's something that he can take back to his community and say, look, like, I don't have Ebola anymore. I, the virus doesn't live in me. I'm safe. Um, so that's kind of one thing they've done to combat stigmatism, or um, is, you know, testing, um, which, is a model very much within a biomedical system, but it also, um, you know, giving, giving them a certificate and allowing them to take that back to their community and proudly display that, that they're Ebola free, um, you know, builds kind of self esteem, builds confidence. Um, other than that, a lot of the survivor services um, are really still getting organized. Um, yeah. You mentioned that capacity building was one of the objectives. Do you have any sense of how that went? Or was it really a drop in all the experts and all the experts leave? It's, it's kind of turning into a drop in all the experts and all the experts leave. Um, even when I was there, the number of responders was cut significantly from what it had been. Um, since I've left, um, the CDC is actually phasing out its health communications part of the team. Um, they actually, I, I went, when I got there, um, I was just a member of the health communications team of three people. Um, and then by the time I left, I had been made the team lead of that team of then two people, which is kind of process of elimination, but it shows you how much the team is kind of being cut down, um, and especially the fact that when I left, there wasn't a replacement for me. Um, so I think they're really anticipating that there wouldn't be any more cases, it wouldn't kind of recycle. Um, so I left, they didn't have anyone to replace me, and then once there was a new case, they actually called me and asked if I could go back, um, which I would have loved to, but I had personal obligations um, this spring, which would have prevented that. Um, for a while, I was kind of on their docket to go in June for a couple of months. However, they've decided now, I think due to funding with Zika, um, that they don't, don't want me anymore. So I think that they are definitely pulling out um, the, the technical experts, which is sad because there's a lot of capacity building left to do. Um, but then I think that also gets into a question about what is the role of CDC and emergency response, and what is the role of um, you know, more development work? CDC is developing an actual country office in Guinea. Um, they have a country director for CDC operations in Guinea, so that will stay um, post-epidemic or you know, post-Ebola, but it's, it's pretty small as of yet, which is sad. So the response um, that you were sent there to deal with is the, is the new, new outbreak of the one new case. Um, I have a question about that. It, you know, I, I have read that in a few cases there have been recurrences, um, and that in some cases that the virus is actually uh, sustained in the eyes. Um, yeah. And, but, it seems to me, and I, I didn't know what you were going to do before tonight, but it seems to me that what you were probably going there for was, was planning ahead and preventing the kind of outbreak that occurred this time from happening again. Yeah. And how, is that, 
Is that, do you feel optimistic about that part? What makes me optimistic about that is the fact that we found that, that new case, that kind of new recurrence, um, and that it didn't just kind of get swept under the rug for months or not recognized. Um, so that makes me optimistic about that. Um, but I'm also, you know, I, Ebola is not gone from West Africa. It's going to, I think that it is really going to be a recurring thing. Hopefully not on the scale as this 2014 epidemic, um, but it's not going anywhere. I think we're going to continue having these little outbreaks. Um, but the main focus of CDC's energy and, and time and resources is on that outbreak period and then the 42 days until outbreaks declared over and then that 90 day surveillance period. Um, and then the, the response teams kind of pull out. But with the country office being there, I think that the vision is to have more of a presence there. Um, and hopefully as that grows, um, more of an epidemiological technical support presence, but also more of a uh, health communications. Um, health communications with CDC kind of is the first piece to get cut, um, for better or for worse. One question I always like to ask uh, people who present in this lecture series, uh, Chris, I'm sure I asked you this question too, um, is uh, what lessons did you take back that you can use here in your job in Kalispell? Um. Well, a very good example of that, which is actually, I can't remember if I started it before. I think I actually started it before I was in Guinea, um, but have gotten way more excited about it after being in Guinea, is that I actually created a frequently asked questions sheet for my program that I run. Because we often, without describing the program too much, we have a really simple application that doesn't really tell you what the program does or what the process is. So you get mailed this pink piece of paper, you fill it out, and we give you an appointment, and then if you miss your appointment, we get angry at you. It's not, it's not very understandable. It's not very accessible, and I don't think that makes for a positive experience for um, you know, the people who take advantage of our program, um, you know, the, the layperson, if you will, the person on the street. And so the th I created this frequently asked question thing, not unlike the messages I was creating in Guinea, but you know, different context. Um, to kind of explain what the program did, like why we covered certain things, why we didn't cover other things, um, you know, what, what to expect and what the process was um, so that it's not us, kind of the health establishment versus consumers. Um, it's let's work together and let's understand each other for better health outcomes for everyone. So that is something that I it started, but definitely got more excited about it, um, saw more connections there after I was in Guinea. How about a flip book? You know, maybe I could think about that. I think maybe in schools that would be something that uh, yeah. might work. Um, yeah. Elementary school. Yeah. With, with the program that I work with now, that, that would be sticky because it's probably less so in Missoula. This, this isn't as much of an issue, but um, in Kalispell, in Libby, in some of the, the more conservative towns up in our corner, breast and cervical are not words that you talk about um, in school. So that's, that's the issue I can see there. But I would love it if we could do that. Um, so. Uh, which that also, some of the flipbook images with Ebola were deemed um, inappropriate um, in Guinea as well. There were communities that, you know, said this is too, um, this is too graphic. We don't want this, especially stuff around um, survivors and how to prevent transmission. Um, may I ask you a question? Yeah, for me a big problem is the sustainable response. I come from developing country and 
uh, a lot of international programs like CDC, UNICEF, UN program are coming in my country and working to have to bring a people expert. But the most problem is that after finish fundraising and their job, what can do in that place? Because Ebola is still there. Yeah. And it is very necessary that the capacity building of their place, not like the expert come and do their job and after three months they go. Yeah. Sustainable response from, uh, from the people over there, I think it's most important. And I, I agree with you. That um, is a large part of my kind of uncomfortablenesses about the work that, that I did with CDC. Um, because... No, it is great, but it is only for the crisis period. And after that, you have a lot of work to do because the problem is still there. Yeah. Don't disappear because the international are gone. Exactly. This is the most critical part. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, which I think in terms of sustainability, um, which is what we need, um, a better model is something like the country office, some, um, you know, a, a continued presence and a continued relationship with local partners rather than crisis, let's jump in and then let's go home to our, our comfortable life here. Um, so I, I struggle with that. Personally. Well, you know, I think... Um I wasn't here last week when Nancy Fitch gave her talk, but I, I always look at Nancy Fitch as a, as a role model in the sense that the work that she's done, and especially done in Africa, is to try to strengthen and build the capacity of local clinics to serve the health needs of their communities. And those health needs uh, are variable content, so it might be malaria, it might be uh, HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. in this case it might be Ebola, but if you have a really strong infrastructure in terms of the health, uh, basic health clinics that provide basic health care, then I think you're in a much better position to head off these kinds of crisis situations. So I think you know that's where we really need to be putting our, our energy and attention. At. So I, I think to follow up on your point is how much of that is going on in Guinea? How much attention? Because that's clearly one of the reasons why this, this Ebola epidemic was so devastating is because the infrastructure had been destroyed in most of these countries by civil war and because of the poverty and the lack of rebuilding. So how much of that is has, how much understanding of that has, has come about and how much change is going on in that area? Or in Sierra Leone, for that matter, Chris, maybe you could address that. Uh, so one of the things that I didn't talk about, um, because it, it opens up a whole new kind of um, Pandora's box, which this, this is very related to, is that while I was there, um, we had a visit from the Global Health Security Agenda, which I'm not sure how, much, how many of you are familiar with that. I actually was not familiar with it um, until I heard about it there because it's something that, um, it's a global health thing that's come together since I graduated from school, which makes me feel kind of old um, and is also a weird thing for me. But essentially, it's um, the set of objectives, not like the, um, you know, what were the Millennium Development Goals, uh, related to health and security. Um, and so while, while I was there, they were having initial talks, um, a, a whole bunch of partners from, um, from CDC, from the State Department, um, from USAID were there in Guinea for uh, meetings with um, the Ghanaian government about, you know, here are these standards that we have and these goals that we have, where does Guinea fall on these? What's the baseline for Guinea? Um, and how can we work towards them with the, you know, with the public goal of having more sustainable health development um, so that Guinea can respond, build capacity so that Guinea can respond to these um, health crises or, you know, avoid health crises in general, um, which I think that's a great goal, 
My experience of the Global Health Security Agenda meetings was that um, it was mostly U.S. government employees who had been flown over to Guinea for the week. Um, some members of the Guinean government were there. They also were busy with other things, not always there. Um, and to me, it felt like a thinly veiled way to um, to ensure as much as possible um, biosafety and biosecurity, so avoiding bioterrorism. Um, so I don't know. So that is there. That is um, a government, or you know, a, a U.S. government, primarily U.S. government, but also multinational um, effort to provide sustainable, like health development um, so that, you know, Guinea wouldn't need as much of an international assistance. Um, but I guess, personally, I would, I'm not sure about the motives there. Um, and then, besides that, there are a lot of non-governmental organizations that are in Guinea for the long term um, doing, you know, less crisis response and more just kind of sustainable work. The role of government institution, like public health institution in Guinea? Um, there's very little public health um, in Guinea. Um, very, very small public health presence. So part of, um, part of the capacity building task is really just to start um, a consciousness that public health is an important government function, function um, and this is how you can kind of model it, um, and this is what to do. So, I hope that answers. Well, um, why don't you all join me again in thanking uh, Rose for her talk, and then I have a few announcements. Thanks for listening.